So once you do get these requests, are, are they usually, do you just email them and say, hey, I could talk about that? Or do you have to send them sort of like a fleshed out idea a little bit? Oh, you absolutely should not do what you just suggested. <laughs> just say, hey, I know something about this. If you'd like to know more, get back to me. So, um, what you want to, there's, there's actually a really great, the, the way I've had the most success um, in, in Harrow is um, by providing responses that meet three criteria. Welcome to the Wear, Wag, Repeat podcast. I'm Tori Mystic. As a dog mom lifestyle expert, blogger, and business owner, I love talking to other women in the pet industry and sharing their advice with you every week. Sit, stay, and listen to the latest episode. This week, I'm resharing an episode from last summer that's made a big impact on my business. Dawn LaFontaine talked to me about how she secures tons of great press coverage for her brand, Cat in the Box. She makes whimsical and delightful cardboard cat playhouses, and when you go to her website, you'll see front and center a collection of media logos for some of the many places she's been featured. So does she work with a pricey PR firm? Does she have a sister who works at these media outlets? Is she just really, really lucky? Well, I don't know about that last one, but the way Dawn secures all this press coverage is using a free tool called Help a Reporter Out, aka Harrow. I followed Dawn's advice for how to use Harrow, and since talking to her, I've received national press coverage in Business Insider and Yahoo News. The Business Insider article was also featured in the Apple News app and in some Japanese outlets. Getting press features for you and your business isn't just for bragging rights. It lends a ton of credibility to your pet business and can help to increase your domain authority, a score that measures how likely your website is to show up in search engine results. So are you intrigued yet? Let me hit play so Dawn can explain her strategy for getting your pet business in the press. And of course, if you enjoy this episode, please, please, please share it on social media. I've created some custom GIFs that are available on Instagram stories. Just search where, wag, repeat, and you'll find a lot of fun options that you can add to your stories. Don LaFontaine is the founder of Cat in the Box, which makes whimsical cardboard box playhouses for cats who think inside the box. She's a lifelong animal lover who enjoys connecting with people who are as crazy about their pets as she is. Well, Dawn, you came to the right place. <laughs> it seems that way. <laughs> Welcome to the Wear Rag Repeat podcast. Um, you know, we, we're all crazy dog people. So <laughs> I love talking about business and then I love talking about pets. So I'm really excited to have you here today. And, um, and what we're going to be talking about is getting publicity and press for your business, which you have a lot of experience in, but first, would you, would you kind of take us back and tell everyone how you got the inspiration for cat in the box? Because it's, it's such a fun idea. It's such a fun name. Um, how did this come to you? Well, actually it came to me when I was, uh, going to my mother's pet sitter with her. She was, uh, dropping her cats off before we went on a trip together and I was looking around at this woman's home, beautifully appointed home, and I noticed that her living room was just cluttered with old Amazon boxes. And she saw me looking around and she said quite sheepishly, ugh, they're for the cats. <laughs> now, um, you know, I've been a lifelong uh, pet lover, a lifelong cat owner, and I already knew that cats were crazy for cardboard boxes. But it got me thinking, why do their owners put up with dirty, ugly shipping cartons in their home? And uh, my boxes are, uh, they're clean, they're cat safe, they're, they're super uh, uh, photogenic. People love to take pictures of their cats in them for social media. Um, but more importantly, they actually meet the cat's needs. Um, cat owners know that they seem to know that their cats love cardboard boxes. But what they aren't aware is there's actual, so actually some serious science that supports uh, a cat's need for a cardboard box. 
So cat owners who are providing a box to their cat are uh, actually helping to meet their biological needs. And that they like just being inside a small enclosure or something like that? Well, the, one of the uh, most important reasons that cats love cardboard boxes is because they don't share the same thermal neutral zone uh, that we have. So a cat's uh, thermal neutral zone is at least 14 or um, up to 25 degrees hotter than ours. So when we keep our homes at an average of 72 degrees, our cats are freezing. And so they're looking for ways to make themselves warm. And one of the really great things about a cardboard box is that it has corrugations. Um, that are make, make it an excellent insulator. And as you pointed out, um, the small space inside a box encourages a cat to curl up and keep itself warm. Now, there are some other uh, reasons, too, that, that cats love cardboard boxes, um, but that's probably the most important one. Well, they probably also like being in cardboard boxes so that then they can jump out and claw someone and surprise <laughs> them, too. <laughs> Well, that, that actually, you make a good point there. So one of the reasons, another reason that they really, really need a cardboard box is because they are predators and they need to practice their hunting skills. Even though we're going to feed them from a can in a couple hours, they need to hunt. So maybe they're hunting a little dust moat that's floating around the living room, or maybe they're hunting a spider, but they need to be, they're ambush predators. So they need to be able to hide and, and then jump out from somewhere. So that's, a, that's really the second reason that cats need a cardboard box. And maybe I'll share the third one since. Yeah, since go already, ahead. Yes, up to the third one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, go so on. the, thir the third one actually has to do with stress relief. And a scientist in the Netherlands actually studied cats who were newly arrived to a Dutch animal shelter. And what she learned by giving certain cats boxes and other cats no boxes were the, that the ones that had access to a box were less stressed. They got used to the shelter more quickly, and they were more interested in interacting with people than cats without boxes. And her conclusion was um, that hiding is a behavioral strategy of the species um, to uh, to um, self relax, self stress, de stress. So when you're giving a cat a box, you're giving her an opportunity to soothe herself when she's stressed out. This is so interesting. I had no idea how much science there was behind me cats neither loving cardboard boxes. Well, and so your product, not only does it help people who have their house covered with Amazon boxes, <laughs> helps them have a more stylish box, but it probably also encourages people who don't have any boxes because they're so, they don't want ugly Amazon boxes around right. and encourages them to have a box or a structure because your boxes are, are really, they are whimsical and, and really cool. Like I like Thank the block you. of cheese, but like the beach house and everything, it's so, so cute. And, um, no matter what your style is, it's a huge upgrade from having an Amazon box floating around. Well, well, the other advantage is too that when you're getting a, a box that was a shipping carton, not only is it filthy, it's been kicked around a dirty warehouse or you know on and off a UPS truck, but it's imprinted with unknown inks, and that was a concern for me because cats um, are notorious cardboard chewers, and some are consumers of cardboard, so they're really not just attracted to going into boxes, but attracted to um, to chewing on them. So if your cat is chewing on a box and you don't know what the ink is, um, you, you know, that might be a concern for some, for some cat owners. And my inks are actually all um, human grade soy inks. Um, so the same inks that would be on your pizza boxes are on, on the boxes for the cat. So you, you can feel comfortable if your cat's a, a cardboard chewer. Right. And not to mention like the tape and, and other things that might be used on exactly. a shipping box. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so how long have you been doing cat in the box? Well, I've been in business for about three years, but I actually had to take um, a little bit of a step back for one year and redesign my products. When uh, I uh, two of my products are quite large and they ship um, assembled, and so that was perfectly fine. We had a, with the shipping rates that existed at the time that I created them, but then the post office effectively eliminated one of the the, the most important rate that I use, and I had to go back and redesign the boxes so that they were more um, compact. And I could ship them in a smaller um, shipping carton. Oh, yeah, that's an interesting problem. You wouldn't think that I didn't think would it would be into. a problem, <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. So, so you've been doing this for about three years, give or take. Mm -hmm. And um, in that time, you've managed to get a lot of press coverage. I was looking at your press section of oh, your website, you. and I'm like scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. Oh, thanks. Um, you've you've gotten a lot of coverage, so. So, so talk to us a little bit about that. What are, what are some of the benefits uh, um, and maybe some of the disadvantages of, of getting this kind of free press? 
Well, there are no real disadvantages except that it's time consuming to do. And for me, I actually have a writing background. So when people are thinking about, I mean, people, some people who have e-commerce sites are you know, really great programmers or they're graphic designers, and they can really lean into those skill sets, which I have none of those skills. Um, but the one thing that comes easily for me is writing. So um, I would tend to, something that might take somebody else a lot longer to do, I, I can whip out in a few minutes. It really isn't a, um, a big time suck for me personally. So that's the one skill that I was leaning into. So for um, no disadvantage to me for doing it, but for someone else, it may be a struggle for them or they might find it frustrating. Um, and the advantages of it, other than um, uh, you know the obvious advantage, which is if you get into the right publication at the right time. Um, I was recently actually in the Sunday Boston Globe. Uh, I was the, the, my product. My, it's a gingerbread house for cats. Was on the front page of uh, a section on um, uh, gifts that were made in New England, which is where I live. Right. And so that resulted in hundreds and hundreds of sales in a single day. And so that's the. I, I don't think you can count on that kind of response, but. Every now and then you get lucky and, and that's what happens. So for all the other um, press uh, coverage that I've received that did not receive um, any uh, immediate sales, um, there are other advantages for people um, like me who primarily run an e-commerce store. Um, and the most important one, I would say, is um, the domain authority. Um, and mm. I'm sure you know something about that. And uh, But basically, the more backlinks that you get, um, the, it increases, and especially when they're from quality um, media outlets, uh, it improves your domain authority. And that, in the end, um, makes Google more likely to show my blog posts to people or my products to people. And so it, it's a sort of a backhanded or, or back alley way of, of getting a benefit from a, media, a bit of media coverage. Yeah. And it's, it's a lot more like authentic than you know, as a blogger, I get so many emails from people saying, oh, I saw you have this article about blah, blah, blah. Can you add my link to it? Yeah. And I'm like, no, <laughs> why would I do that? <laughs> yes, I get those as well. Yeah. So going out and getting and getting press coverage um, from even small outlets can be really good for your domain authority. So that's, Absolutely. that's a really good point. So one of the avenue is a lot of people might say, well, how, how do I actually get this press coverage? You know, do I have to like go knock on the door at the, the Wall Street Journal or something? Um, but you don't, there's something called Harrow. Um, and that's help a reporter out if people aren't familiar with it. Um, and I, I told you before we hit record that I've used it off and on over the years. It can be overwhelming how many, um, requests that are for that. But tell us a little bit, what is Harrow um, and how does it work? Well, sure. So Harrow is a free service. And what it does is connects um, reporters to subject matter experts. So uh, there are two sides to Harrow. Um, basically, the one side are the bloggers, the journalists um, who submit queries. And the other side are the subject matter experts, the PR professionals, um, ordinary citizens, um, like who just want to see themselves in uh, real or virtual print. Um, so you sign up, as you mentioned, for these newsletters and signing up is free. And once you do sign up, you will get overwhelmed with newsletters from Harrow um, three times a day. You don't have to read them all. You don't have to open them all, <laughs> but you will get them. And the newsletter is basically a list of all the stories that some journalist or reporter has got in the works. And they're looking for content for those stories. So if you think that you have something that you want to say about one of those stories, you can um, just click on the hyperlink that is um, within the little request, and it will bring you to a short paragraph that describes in more de detail what the reporter is looking for, what her deadline is or his deadline, uh, what sometimes what publication they, they um, are writing for, and, um, and then you can respond from there. And is there anything, are there any red flags in there of things that, that, are not worth it to click on or or do you think they're all good options? Well, um, there are, there's sort of two categories of things. One are genuine media outlets, um, actual newspapers and magazines or, um, or blogs. Um, and, and all they're looking for is content. There are some, some bloggers, however, who are looking uh, for products in exchange for a backlink. And some of those are no follow links. And this is, this goes, this is a little too deep for this. We're getting into the weeds <laughs> now. Yeah. 
um, there are advantages to still participating in those. And it really depends on what kind of products you have to sell, what your goals are, and um, and even, you know, frankly, the cost of your products. If they're not too expensive, sometimes it's not, um, it, it, you know, you might get something out of it for a very, you know, modest investment. Um, so that's a personal decision that you have to make after thinking about it a little bit more. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because it's exactly what I was thinking is I've seen some requests that are for gift guides and right. they want you they're very explicit that they say you must send, you know, this item to us and we will not return it to you and da, 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 da. and right. I was always hesitant to to do anything like that. Um but there are a ton of things that are just asking for expert advice. Exactly. Yeah, and so those are really great. So, so once you do get these requests, are are they usually? Do you just email them and say, "Hey, I could talk about that," or do you have to send them sort of like a fleshed out idea a little bit? Oh, you absolutely should not do what you just suggested. <laughs> <laughs> just say, "Hey, I know something about this. If you'd like to know more, get back to me." <laughs> so, um, what you want to there's there's actually a really great the the way I've had the most success um, in in Harrow is um, by providing responses that meet three criteria. The first criteria is that it is a fast response. So um, everybody knows about Harrow. If you're the one who hems and haws and wants to craft just the exactly perfect response and you think, oh, well, I'm really busy with this right now. I'm packing you know, shipments to go out. I'll, I'll get to it later tonight. Um, you've already missed the boat. If you actually miss the deadline that is stated on the Harrow query, don't even bother responding because Harrow will not deliver your response to the journalist. But even if you're just a few hours late, I mean, the the journalist is already have, going to have gotten 50 responses. And maybe right. the first five that he read um, met his needs. And it would take a really special person to um, continue reading after they got everything they needed from the first five. So you want to be one of the first ones who respond. So the first criteria, it's fast. The second criteria for a good response on Harrow is that it's complete. So um, answer every question that is on there. Um, uh, provide all the information that was requested in the order that it was requested. If they ask for a headshot, provide a headshot, but do not attach a photo to your Harrow response because it's it's not delivered that way. You do need to provide a link to your headshot. And so you could put it on Dropbox or something like absolutely. that. Absolutely. I even keep a little um, invisible page on my website that, mm. that's there or Dropbox or, or Google Drive is perfect. Um, and the final uh, thing that makes for a good Harrow response is that it is thorough. Um, you got to answer the de- the question with more details than you even think is necessary. I mean, it's possible there's an angle to the story that the reporter hasn't thought of themselves or didn't know about. Um, go ahead and practically write the story for them. I have done so. Um, make the job as easy as possible for them because um, they may be more likely to include your response then. Yeah. Okay. I need to, I, you're inspiring me. <laughs> um, to get back on Harrow, I have it on pause right now because I was getting too many emails. Yes. A little hack for that is I set up a separate folder so they just go yeah. Yeah. in their own Harrow folder, and then but I but I used to go in there a couple t- couple times a week, and I'd go back and look at like a couple days past emails. But now I know that I should really just focus on that day's emails. Forget about what came yesterday and the day before. You should focus on that. It, they come out morning, noon, and night. Right. If you should. If- if you're interested in looking at the one from the morning, look in the morning. If, mm-hmm. you know, don't look at the morning one in the night. Even though some of them do have, you know, a deadline that's three or four days later, it, there's really, I'm not saying there's no reason to, to, to respond. I'm saying that if you're going to spend effort on this, do it in a timely manner. Right. And if it's overwhelming, which it is, um, don't don't even check yesterday's email. Just, no, just look right, at the one exactly. that you got today. Because mm-hmm. that, that will really stress you out because like then you're also going to see all the ones, oh, I could have... I could have responded to that one and now I missed it. (laughs) So don't just, what's past is past. What if your pet could see an experienced and compassionate veterinarian without ever leaving the house? This year, I discovered Better Vet, a mobile vet that empowers pet parents to get expert veterinary help from the comfort of their own homes. Our pets often associate carriers, car rides, and vet offices with anxiety. By examining your pet at home, it not only eliminates stress and fear, but it also allows the doctor to see your pet 
in their natural environment and better assess their health. I used the Better Vet app to book a wellness exam for Bert and Lucy. Dr. Olivia Wilson and her vet tech Amanda brought the vet's office to my house. For Lucy, this was great news because she gets a lot of fear in exam rooms. At home, she could have her emotional support stuffed animals with her at all times. Dr. Olivia did a thorough exam on both dogs, answered all of my many questions, gave Lucy a rabies vaccine, and took a blood sample from Bert, all right in my living room. After our appointment, I compared the price to a brick and mortar vet that we visited last year, and it was only slightly more to have an expert vet come to my house. Well worth it, in my opinion. Would your pet like home vet visits? I love this experience so much, I became a Better Vet BFF. Check out bettervet.com and use my code BVBFFTMystic to get $100 off your first visit. I know it's long, so I'll put that code in the description for this episode. Treat your pet to vet care of the 21st century at bettervet.com. Dot com. So, okay, another thing that has kind of held me up in Hero is that a lot of times the pet related questions or queries are looking for a veterinarian or a certified professional trainer or some sort of credentialed person. Whereas a lot of us have expertise, but we're not necessarily certified in it. So what do you think about replying to those kind of queries? In my experience, they're kind of a waste of time. Uh, if it does say animal behaviorist, that's a little bit of a gray area. That, that person isn't looking for a veterinarian, but the ones who are looking for a veterinarian are looking for a veterinarian. Don't waste your time. That being said, you have to dig deep because many of them don't ask for, I've been in Pop Sugar, I've been in M- NBC News, um, U.S. News and World, World Report, all of these on, on pet-related topics, and I'm not a veterinarian, and I'm not an animal behaviorist. That being said, um, pet businesses should not just be looking at pet-only haro responses. There are a lot of other categories, or at least you know one major category, that you can reply to, and you don't need to be an expert. So I tend to reply to a lot of the business related questions. Um, I responded, I was in one, um, I think it was this one was LegalZoom, um, entrepreneurs over the age of 50 and um, all, all kinds of you know questions about e-commerce and about blogging. And there's no reason not to answer those because you'll get the same little bump in your domain authority from those as you will from one of the pet ones. And it, you might be a more unique expert, you know, since you're in the pet industry instead of someone who's in exactly. finance or something that there's a, a lot of people already submitting for it. Right. I actually think that is why I've gotten included in a lot of these articles because I, frankly, my my little headshot actually is a picture of me with a uh, with a cat in one of my products. Of and course, it's, it's a. I mean, it's a it's a fun picture. Everybody else has got a boring headshot, and I've got a cat in a milk carton. So uh, I do think that may be one of the reasons that I've been included. Yeah. So good photo, thorough response and reply immediately. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Um, So after you get this coverage, um, you submit, they, I guess, write back and say, say, thank you. Do they usually send you the finished link or do you have to find it on your own? How does that work? Well, I will say you'll never probably hear from them ever again. (laughs) So so whether they include you or not, you may, you may not be uh, you may never hear from them ever. Okay. Again. Now the the Harrow rule is that if they include you, they're supposed to send you the link. That doesn't always happen. So um, I was uh, googling myself recently, and I found out I'd been in another Reader's Digest article. I the person never let me know, um, which is you know it was a happy little you know treasure hunt that I you know found a little treasure. But um, but they're supposed to have let you know. Now let's say they do the right thing and they do let you know. Um, there's a couple things that you can do afterwards um, for yourself. I don't know if this is something that you wanted to talk about. Yeah, go on. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the first thing you should do is actually write the thank you note to the journalist, the, the thank you note that, that you're not going to get from them. Um, <laughs> so, and, and the reason that, that you do that is, of course, it's the right thing to do. 
Um, but the second thing is you want to make, maintain a good relationship with these freelance writers because they write for multiple publications. And if they're ever revisiting a topic um, and remember how easy you were to work with or how pleasant, um, there's a chance that you'll they'll use you again. I, I have been in Pop Sugar a couple of times, and now I know I've, I've been in Reader's Digest a couple of times, too. And I don't know if that was just luck or because of um, their good experience with me. So the, so the first thing you do is write the thank you note. Um, the second thing I always do is promote the exposure on my own website. So I do this in a couple of places. Um, you've seen my website now, so you know I've got a little um, sort of static graphic on the front page that just has um, the, the logos from the more prestigious press that I've gotten. So that's on my front page. I do, as you pointed out earlier, have um, a press page, which is just a list and with links to all the articles. And I call that my in the muse page. That's yes, I saw little, that. I like that. Little cat humor. <laughs> and uh, finally, if it's a very prestigious um, bit of press, I will usually put out a little blog post on that so that anybody who is, you know, looking through my blog post will see, you know, that, that'll just pop up in and amongst the others. And so, for example, I was in the print version of uh, First for Women, the the magazine that you get at the grocery store checkout mm -hmm. line. <laughs> and so that was a pretty big deal. So I did write a little blog post about that. And so this. The second thing that I do after I thank the journals, or third thing, I guess, thank the journalists, put it on my website, um, is I do promote that link on, on social media. And the journalists really do like when you do that. So um, if it's a business-related article, I usually post it on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, I, I know that my cat peeps are not going to care about the you know mompreneur article or whatever. Um, so I, I want to be mindful of my audience when I'm thinking about where I post. And uh, if it's a niche related story, as you were talking about, um, something having to do with pets or, or cats, um, I do post that on my business Facebook page. And I currently have under, I have about 9,000 followers on Instagram. When you get the 10,000 followers, <laughs> I will run um, an Instagram story on, um, on a pet related thing to, as, a, as a kind of service to other you know, pet people who might be interested in the story. Right. And um, and then the last thing that I do is I include it in my email marketing. So I do email my customers um, once a week and I include my latest blog post and, you know, you know, whatever other business news is, that's in there. But I have a little thing on the bottom that says, you know, I was so honored to appear in X, Y and Z with a little bit of a link. Now, I don't know if anybody actually clicks on that. I have no idea. Maybe they see it. Maybe they don't. It's all the way at the bottom. But if anybody does see it, I would like them to think that I would like to think that it, it confers, um, you know, some gravitas on me and my business or that other people think either I'm an expert on cats or pets or that um, I'm a serious business owner. So um, there it is. Yeah. I mean, there's so many benefits, like you said, even if it's not, you know, maybe you get this fantastic coverage that you get hundreds of sales and that's a miracle. But sometimes just having the links and then having having the ability to brag about it to your own right, audience, right. Um, that's a huge benefit in and of itself. Yeah, because you can't can't always control what what the outlet does um, with your quote or your photo or the article or how they share it. Um, sometimes it'll be on the cover. Sometimes it'll be buried way in the back. Exactly. So you never know. Right. And you, you know that um, if you're not necessarily going to get sales from something and and frankly, when you're in the media like this, I mean, the who's who's reading that? They're not somebody who's out shopping for a cat playhouse at that moment, probably. I mean, even, and the, you know, the rare occasion when you're in the Sunday Boston Globe gift guide at Christmas time. Yeah. That, okay. That person's shopping, but every, nobody else is shopping when they're reading about, um, I don't know, how to blog or something or, uh, you know, what's your social media voice or, or whatever yeah. other question I've answered. So they're probably not going to click and buy that minute and they may never click and buy from me ever, but this is another way of uh, finding the benefit in that kind of exposure. Yeah. And I mean, just the SEO benefit, I'm like, I'm always obsessed with SEO. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. And, and so that, that is a huge benefit in and of itself, which is kind of like a hit. It's a hidden thing that you can't even really see, but it's doing stuff behind the scenes. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, so Don, tell us now, now that we've talked about Harrow, you've inspired me to sign back up and I, and also to sign up. I never was on the business list. I was always on like the lifestyle list where the pet stuff is. Oh, 
I uh, need to sign up for the business list. Now, I may have just clicked everything when I signed up because I don't remember choosing one or the other. And and some pet things show up in other categories. So even if you're just looking for pet things, they're not always in lifestyle. Sometimes they're in general or they're um, they're in other areas. Oh, so, so I'm going to sign up for everything. Yes. And, and then what I used to do, just, I don't know if you, if you do this, but just for people listening to, for like a little bit of sanity, I would just do like Apple F like to find, and mm-hmm. I would type in pet or dog or whatever, because scrolling through the whole email is kind of makes my eyes cross. <laughs> True. But then you miss the business ones, but then I would miss the business ones. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to do that. All right. Okay. I'm going to sign up for everything and I'm going to look at it all. <laughs> Uh, or I would say, you know, say to yourself, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm only going to do Mondays or something. Yeah. <laughs> I just, um, and just then, give up and on the others. Don't feel overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. It's, easy, it's easy for me. I actually, one of the things that I do that might be helpful to your readers is once I create an answer to something, you will find that the same questions get asked over and over and over again. So what I did was I created a little Word document that contains all my sort of frequently asked questions. <laughs> and I just have a little um, index at the top, you know, um, you know, uh, moms who reinvented themselves or, um, crafty cat toys or, and, and I just have, so a little index that says, um, you know, what, what the, what the responses are. And I have about 48 pages. Each with each one is an individual response that I've already written. So I don't have to reinvent the wheel every time I respond. It's all there. I might have to tweak my answer a little bit, but sometimes I can just use it wholesale. Oh, I answered this one already. Cut and paste, cut and paste. It's all done. I love that tip. This is that's the best tip of this whole okay. episode. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I really enjoyed hearing about the science of of cats thermodynamics, but <laughs> having a Google <laughs> Doc of all of your answers pre-written, that's genius. Um, okay, so so we do have to we have to flip back to cats and pets in general. So right currently you have two dogs and do. and you are a, a foster cat mom waiting for your next litter of the yeah. kitties. <laughs> I can't um, wait. tell us, tell us about your pets and, and your dogs and, um, and, and why it's so important to you to be surrounded by pets. Oh, I've been an animal lover my entire, entire life. I mean, I, I would take bugs in when my parents wouldn't let me have pets. I, we grew up with, I, I talked them into finally letting me get birds and guinea pigs and rabbits, rats. We've had so many pet rats. Um, I finally got talked them into letting me get a cat just as I was going off to college. But um, now that I'm an adult, long an adult, I can have as many animals as I want. <laughs> so uh, my kids were raised with all kinds of animals. And we have always been involved in rescue. Um, it was really important for me when my kids were younger to, um, to, to do something that, that gives back. And so we used to walk racing greyhounds every single summer. Um, we were volunteers for Mainly Rat Rescue, which is an amazing, amazing organization. And, and we always, have, of course, have um, rescue dogs and, um, and cats. So my current two dogs are uh, very elderly. She's sitting right next to me right now, um, almost 13 year old. We don't know exactly because she's a rescue. Uh, Great Pyrenees, who um, is just as sweet as can be. And her name is Stella. And we also have, we actually share custody of uh, a black lab uh, named Zidi with my daughter. My daughter raised her for guiding eyes for the blind while she was in college. And uh, the dog went off to guiding eyes training, but she was actually released due to skin infections while my daughter was studying abroad. So we picked her up. We actually had her full time for about two years while my daughter finished school. Um, and now that my daughter's in grad school, we sort of share custody of her. So, um, and she's just pure chaos, as you can imagine, a very exuberant black lab um, would be. Oh, I was going to say she must be so well-trained because she's oh, she, a she's guide well-trained, dog dropout. She's, she's extremely well-trained and she's very, very obedient, but she's such a bundle of energy and you have to, <laughs> and as you know, uh, you know, exercise Power is course. the most important, yeah. important thing with dogs and she needs a lot of exercise. So we have to make sure we meet her needs. Yeah, definitely. That was the number one thing. When I met my dog, Bert, when he was in the shelter, he was like bouncing off the walls yes, literally. Yeah. And I was, uh, I was not afraid of that or phased by it at all. Cause I said, he just needs more exercise. And you know, if he comes and comes and lives with me, he'll get plenty of exercise. And now he's sleeps next to me all day long. So <laughs> you need my ZD is what you need. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so send her down here and she'll run around with us and she'll, she'll be tired. <laughs> she needs a 10 mile run like twice a day. That's literally what she needs. to. Be oh, happy. <laughs> well, we don't quite do that. <laughs> In that case, I would just say, wait for her to get older. <laughs> <laughs> She's four. <laughs> when is she going to get older? Like eight. <laughs> 
Uh, well, Don, it's been such a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much for sharing this valuable information. Um, I know you've at least inspired me to get back on Harrow and hopefully some other people will as well, but um, tell everyone where can they, where can they find you online and where can they see the cat in the box uh, and learn more about your products? Well, my, um, my website is the cat is in the box.com. And you could of course also find me on Instagram, um, Pinterest and uh, Facebook and my, it's various versions of the cat is in the box. Um, on Instagram, it's the period cat period is period in the, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. You get the idea. Yes. <laughs> Good. Well, we'll all look for you. And of course, um, if anyone needs to find Dawn, you can look at the show notes for this episode. um, And I will link to everything there. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you so much for having me, Tori. It was really a joy to talk to you. What did you like most about this episode? Find me on Instagram at teamistic and let me know what intrigued you or what questions you have about starting or growing your own dog-inspired business. You can also screenshot this episode and tag me in your stories. I love to see who is listening out there. Some of the best conversations happen after the episode, right? So track me down over on Instagram or join the Wear, Wag, Repeat Labs Facebook group to connect with other dog-obsessed entrepreneurs. And as always, you can find all the links and resources discussed in this episode at wearwagrepeat.com slash podcast. See you back here next week.